Mastering Compression Settings Overview In this video, the chapters are in no particular order, but we're going to be discussing various forms of compression in depth, as well as introduce some useful techniques that you could use when mastering. We'll cover how to glue a mix together with compression, as well as how to very transparently compress to get a cohesive and colorful sound, or solely control dynamics respectively. Then we'll cover how compression can alter the frequency response, and how we could use a multiband compressor to mimic how our ears compress in order to create natural sounding compression. Next, we'll discuss New York style parallel compression and how it could be used creatively to affect the master in a way that most regular processors can't before we discuss the benefits of simultaneous expansion and compression and how compressors could be used to alter a master's stereo width. Next, we'll cover how to bring quieter details of a master to the forefront without the need for aggressive peak down compression. Lastly, we'll cover how to DS during a mastering session to attenuate sibilance, but avoid compressing unrelated frequencies, then how to reduce resonances with a couple of different processors, and finally how to use dynamic EQ to attenuate out of key frequencies. Now I'm guessing that you won't want to use all of these types of compression, but at least one will definitely be helpful for your style of mastering. So stick around to learn about each type and technique. Master Compression to Glue Mix one of the most popular ways to introduce compression when you're mastering is as a way to glue together the sound. Glue compression is created by setting a longer release time so that multiple transients are compressed collectively. The benefit is that the master sounds cohesive, but we need to be careful since affecting multiple transients can affect the perceived timing of the track. Now to do this the right way, we need to time our compression with the BPM of the track. So if our BPM is 140, we could divide 60,000 by 140. The result is one quarter note in milliseconds. In this example, 429 milliseconds is one quarter note. Then I can multiply this number by four to get one whole note and subtract the value of our attack time and use this value as the release time. Now for the sake of understanding this better, let's say that we use a release time that is not in time with our track, say one second. Then whenever the signal returns to unity, it's gonna sound amplified relative to what was just attenuated. In other words, it'll serve a somewhat similar purpose to a transient. If this return to unity is out of time with the track, we can severely mess up the perceived dynamics and subsequent timing of a master. In addition to timing our release, we could use a compressor that imparts a specific tone to the signal. Now, this means a compressor that introduces harmonics and maybe some subtle equalization. For this reason, many engineers like to use variable compressors, more commonly called Varimu compressors. I'll use this Pulsar Varimu plugin to demonstrate the idea, but Klinghelm offers a great free option if you're interested. Let's take a listen to glue compression being introduced with a very new type compressor and with the release set to be in time with the track. Creating transparent mastering compression. Now, sometimes when you're introducing compression, you don't want to create a colorful sound or even be able to tell that the compressor is there at all. Now, when this is the case, we'll want to use clean, transparent compressors and with in-time settings that return the signal to Unity quickly, but in a way that doesn't result in distortion. Now, let's use this free plugin, Tokyo Don Labs Katelnikov, to introduce transparent compression. Notice that with it, we could introduce both peak down and RMS detection. RMS, or root mean square detection, will average the incoming signal to measure an average loudness. It's going to result in more transparent compression. However, it may lead to loud peaks getting through, so we may want to find a good balance between peak and RMS detection and pay attention to when the signal is being attenuated. We'll want to set an attack time that's no quicker than 10 milliseconds and a release no quicker than 50 milliseconds. The reason being, if we set quicker times, we could cut into the transient, in turn causing harmonic distortion. This is great to have the transient stick out, but it's not too useful for clean sounding compression. Additionally, I'll set the release to be in time with the track, similar to the last chapter, but instead of a whole note, I'll use a 16th note. To find this, I'll take 60,000 and divide it by the BPM, and then divide that number by 4. Lastly, we'll want to set the stereo sensitivity toward the center or the mid-image. This way, we're detecting and affecting where the majority of the master's energy is. Now, be sure to carefully set your threshold and use a low ratio to ensure that we don't compress more than 1.5 dB. Let's take a listen to this compressor being used and notice how it cleanly attenuates the master. Using multiband compression as EQ. Multiband compression is super useful if you want to control a specific bandwidth of frequencies. It could be also less noticeable than regular stereo compression for the same reason. Now, all of the concepts that we've discussed in the last two chapters still apply, like timing the release to be in time with our BPM and avoiding super quick attack and release times to avoid distortion. 
The main difference is that we could use very fast attack and release times on the highest frequencies since the distortion typically caused by these settings only occurs to low frequencies. The main idea that I want to introduce though is that compressing specific frequencies both controls dynamics and causes equalization. So let's say the track is sounding muddy and I'm having trouble hearing the vocals. I could center the compression on 250 Hz and attenuate by 1 to 2 dB. This is going to attenuate the frequency range like an EQ but do so dynamically instead of statically. Now this is a great way to alter the frequency response of a master, but only when a particular range becomes too loud. Or let's say that the reverb is covering up the vocal too much. I could dynamically attenuate two to five kilohertz on the side image so that the mid image vocal cuts through whenever it's present. Also, I'll be using this FabFilter multiband, but a good free alternative is TDR Nova. Let's take a listen to multiband compression being used in this way and notice how it shapes the frequency response. Recreating how our ears compress sound. While we're on the topic of frequency-specific compression, let's cover how we could use multiband compression to mimic how our ears naturally compress sounds that are too loud. Now, I covered this in our last video on vocals, but let's take a look at it one more time. In short, our ears compress frequencies below 1000 Hz whenever the sound gets too loud. This attenuation is between 1 to 20 dB, depending on how loud the sound is. Also, the two structures that cause this can't move instantly to attenuate the sound it takes about 40 milliseconds for them to tense up or contract, and they stay contracted for about 150 milliseconds. With that in mind, we could use a multiband compressor and attenuate frequencies below 1000 Hz by a couple of dB. We'll set the attack time to 40 milliseconds and the release to 150 milliseconds to mimic the response of the two ear structures, and if it's available, use a softer knee to cause gradual compression. Now be sure to avoid look ahead and any other unrelated settings. Let's take a listen, and like the last chapter, you could use the TDR Nova as a free alternative to this plugin. New York Style Mastering Compression New York Style Compression is a combination of parallel compression and EQ. To create it, we'll need to set up a send and corresponding auxiliary track from our channel track. On it, we'll insert a compressor and an EQ. We could use compression that glues the signal together or transparent settings, but with a great amount of attenuation. Since we'll be blending this effect in with the auxiliary tracks channel fader, we could be more aggressive with our settings. Then, we'll insert our EQ. We could use a fully parametric one to really control what part of the compressed signal gets amplified, or we could use something more stylistic, like a Pultec EQ to shape the sound. If it's available, be sure to use linear phase settings for the EQ to avoid phase cancellation between this track and the original channel. With the EQ, we could amplify the kick and the vocal range, and maybe sub in the highs to accentuate important ranges, but what you amplify is up to you. Now, if you want to get even more of the sound of the compression, we could insert an EQ before it and drive the frequencies into it. This way, the compressor is having to work harder on those ranges, in turn causing compression on those frequencies to be more apparent. This method both controls dynamics, gives you the option to equalize the compression, and makes it easier to automate this compression by altering the aux tracks channel fader. I've been using this FabFilter Pro C2, but let's use this free SSL emulation by Analog Obsession and create parallel compression with a lot of character. I'll equalize both before and after compression to emphasize important ranges and then blend in the effect. Let's take a listen and notice how the master sounds fuller and how the amplified frequencies stick out a bit more. Omnipressor Expansion and Compression The Omnipressor is a unique compressor. It allows you to set levels for compression and expansion simultaneously, resulting in signal attenuation whenever the signal goes above the threshold and expansion whenever the signal falls below the threshold. As a result, the signal stays within a dynamic range, resulting in louder parts becoming quieter and quieter parts becoming louder. Although this effect is typically used for mixing, it could be used to great effect when you're mastering. If we limit the expansion and the compression ranges to 1 dB, Set the function or ratio near the middle, and very carefully set our threshold we could achieve a dynamically controlled and surprisingly loud master without any unwanted artifacts. Now I find that this effect works great right before limiting if I want to get the signal louder but I don't want to resort to heavy amounts of attenuation to achieve it. Although you could use two instances of a free compressor like M Compressor by Melda Audio to achieve compression and then expansion, 
The routing is going to be different from this plugin, so unfortunately I don't know of a free alternative that matches this plugin exactly. Let's take a listen to this plugin being used with subtle settings, and notice how it makes the track louder, dynamically controlled, and makes quieter details easier to hear. Mastering Compression for Stereo Expansion Now we touched on this concept in Chapter 4 when we use multiband compression on our side image, but let's go into more detail about affecting a master stereo width with compression. Now if we use a compressor that's capable of mid-side compression, we could introduce more compression to the mid-image to cause stereo expansion. Whenever the mid-image is attenuated, the side image will sound louder relative to the mid or the centered image. Usually I want to attenuate the mid image by 0.5 to 1.5 dB and avoid things like makeup gain since this would negate the stereo expansion aspect. Now some plugins that work well for this include press work by Yuhi, Weiss maximization if you select the wide algorithm and the more comprehensive DS1 compressor by Weiss, and the FabFilter Pro MB if you want the attenuation to be frequency specific. A great free option though is the M compressor by Melda Audio. If we open the toolbar section we could change the routing from stereo to mid and side, or in this case just the mid image. Ultimately, this is one of my favorite ways to compress a master since it controls dynamics and results in a very natural sounding stereo expansion. Let's take a listen with more aggressive settings than usual, and notice how the master sounds wider whenever the mid-image is attenuated. Why upward compression is so useful. Now so far off the compression types that we've covered causes attenuation from the peaks down or from an average loudness down as is the case with RMS compression. But one of the most useful forms of compression, in my opinion, is upward compression. In the case of the Waves MV2, it can measure quieter parts of the signal, control the dynamics of that quieter section, and then amplify it. This results in a controlled dynamic range without the need for attenuating peaks. More importantly, it amplifies quieter details and makes the overall master sound fuller and more forward. Another option is the Sonics Oxford Inflator. It works a little differently by prioritizing aspects of the digital signal with more zeros than ones, or at least that's how it's described in the manual, and then it amplifies these parts of the signal and adds harmonics to fill out the sound. Alternatively, you could use the Free M Compressor and use a custom shape setting to amplify the quieter signal whenever it falls below the threshold. Now this concept is similar, but the final sound is going to be a little different. One more free option is OTT by x for records which offers frequency specific maximization, but you'll need to use incredibly subtle settings with this one since it's a really aggressive effect. Let's take a listen to the effect with my personal favorite option, the Sonics Limiters Enhance function, and notice how we're not attenuating the peaks, however, the details of the master are greatly increased, as is the overall loudness. Upward compression on mid frequencies. Now that we understand upward compression, let's see how it could be used creatively. Now if we use upward compression in a form of New York style parallel compression, we can greatly emphasize a particular range of frequencies. To do this, I'll set up a send from the channel track, and on the corresponding auxiliary track, first insert a linear phase EQ. With it, I'll isolate the signal to the mid frequencies by using a high pass and low pass filter. Where you could center these filters is up to you, but I set mine to 400 hertz and 4 kilohertz respectively. Then I'll insert an upward compressor or maximizer. In this case, I'll use the Sonics Inflator, but you could use any of the options that we discussed in the last chapter. Now with the inflator, I'll set its effect to 100% and then blend in the upward process mid frequencies with my original signal. Now with this setup, we reduce the dynamics of the mid frequency range, greatly increased aspects that would have otherwise been masked, and then dialed in the effect until the overall sound is balanced. Like chapter 6, we have the option to emphasize frequencies into the processor if we want them to be more apparent. So, I'll create a bell around my vocal's clarity range around 2 kHz, and also amplify the side image around 500 Hz. Now this is just what I thought sounded best for this particular track, but you could of course use your ears and emphasize the frequencies that you want more of. Let's take a listen and notice how the mid frequencies are present and how the overall master sounds fuller and more impressive. DSing during mastering. 
Although DSing isn't always needed when you're mastering, it does serve an important role when it is needed. Now, finding the right settings can be challenging, so let's take a look into it. We'll need to isolate the compression to the range of sibling frequencies, usually between 5 to 8 kHz, but you'll need to take a listen to find these or listen and observe the frequency spectrum. Now, after we've isolated the attenuation to the correct range, we'll need to ensure that the attenuation only occurs whenever a sibilant occurs. Now, if you don't set the threshold correctly, it's really easy to attenuate unrelated aspects of the signal like the symbols or other high frequencies. Doing this correctly comes down to listening carefully and observing the attenuation and seeing if it pairs up whenever a sibilant occurs or if it's attenuating any unrelated part of the signal. I like to use this Weiss DSer, but you could also use a multiband compressor. If you want a free option, TDSer is a good alternative, and I would also recommend Siblins 4 by Tone Boosters, which offers a lot of control and it's really affordable. Let's take a listen and pay attention to how attenuation only occurs whenever Siblins is present. Resonance Reduction with Multiband Compression Although resonance reduction is usually thought of as a form of equalization, it's really a multiband compressor with a preset threshold that determines when to attenuate various frequencies. It's an incredibly useful tool when you're trying to create a balanced master, so let's take a look at some of the settings. I'll use the Soothe 2 plugin, and to make it easy, I'll select the Balance to the Grammy Awards setting, which measures the mid and the side image separately to apply compression when needed. From there, we could adjust the pre-emphasis EQ bands as needed to attenuate aspects of the master that are too prevalent. Now the low mids is usually a treble area, and the same could be said about the sibilance range. But of course use your ears to find what's best. Lastly, if you use this plugin, be sure to use higher quality settings to reduce phase cancellation and to dial in the effect with the mix dial. Although I don't know of a free alternative, Smooth Operator by Baby Audio is a good affordable option. Let's take a listen and notice how the master sounds a lot more balanced. Out of key, subtractive, dynamic EQ. In chapter 4, we discussed how multiband compression can change the frequency response and in a way be used as equalization. If we have a dynamic EQ, we can pinpoint which frequencies we compress. In this case, we'll attenuate out of key frequencies. This results in a more musical sound since desirable in key frequencies become louder relative to out of key frequencies. To find these frequencies, we could use a free online TuneBat analyzer, and once we know the key, look up which frequencies are in and out of key. From there, we could use this Pro-Q3's piano roll to snap the band's center frequency to exact notes, but if you don't have this EQ, you could always look up the exact frequencies of the notes and center bands on those. Lastly, we'll enable dynamics for each band and set the threshold as needed. We're aiming for between 0.5 to 1 dB of attenuation, and it's best to set a narrow Q value so that the majority of the attenuation occurs on the out of key note. Let's take a listen and notice how the track sounds slightly more balanced and a little more musical. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out the link in the description for a free mastered sample of your mix.